like I'm going to be competing with the rain this morning. Well, as I told you before, we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 12, and what I'd like to do is read uh, verses 1 through 11. Uh, but we're only going to be looking this morning at verses 1 through 8, and this evening we're going to be focusing on verses um, uh, 9 through 11. So, let's begin by reading the text. This is what John writes. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. So remember, we're focusing on the first eight verses here, and we, we do want to uh, look at three different things. We want to see the love that the Savior has for his people. We want to see the love his people have for him. We want to see what the tendencies are of those who don't love Jesus. Okay. Now, Again, as, as we've been going through the Gospel of John, we do need to realize that um, even though there's basically an equal number of chapters in, in the Gospel of John, that John has a bit of a different focus with regard to his time frames. We're, we're getting very, very close to the end of Jesus' ministry. So we're only in chapter 12, and we still have not quite 10 chapters ahead of us, but or maybe we do have 10 chapters. It's it's already more than halfway through his ministry and a lot of this is going to focus on the, the last things he had to say to his disciples and of course his death on the cross, his resurrection and things of that nature. But we do see by this point as Jesus' ministry continues to move forward more and more opposition to our Lord Jesus Christ proving that what our Lord says is true regarding the condition of this world in general that there are two kingdoms two distinct kingdoms that are continually warring in this world, that are warring with each other. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And everyone in the world can be divided into one of the two kingdoms. Nobody stands outside of, of both of them. You're in one or the other. Now what might surprise us or may not surprise us because we've heard this a, a number of times is that this kingdom or these two kingdoms don't exist just in the world, they both also exist within the church. Now, certainly we see that this was true in Jesus' day. Remember that Israel was the Lord's church in the Old Covenant. They were the ones that he had set apart from the world to be his peculiar people. He had entrusted his word to them, and they were to be his lights in the world. Remember, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, salvation is from the Jews. They are the ones who possess the truth, the true worship of God, and if anyone was to come to him, they had to come through them. They were the ones he had entrusted with this task. But that didn't mean, and it never meant, that all of them were saved, clearly. We know from what we've seen in John's Gospel that that certainly wasn't the case as well as what we see from Israel's history. As a matter of fact, what we see is that actually very few of them were saved. Paul writes in, in Romans 8 verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. 
Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Now, I bring that up only to point out that this is why Jesus' ministry had such a dividing influence among the Jews. Some of these Jews were saved. Some of them were being saved through his ministry, such as those who believed when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The kingdom of God was growing under the ministry of Jesus Christ, but we still have to recognize there were many more who were not saved than were saved. Remember last time we saw some of those who didn't believe in Jesus, who actually saw the same miracle of the raising of Lazarus, go to the Jewish leaders to tell them what Jesus had done for Lazarus. And instead of believing in Jesus, they immediately began to plot his death. There were two kingdoms at work in the church in Jesus' day. Now sadly, the same continues today, although thankfully not to the same extent, but it really has to do, as we know from our experience and from the Word of God, to how faithfully and purely the Word of God is actually preached in, in the congregation, in the fellowship, in the church. To the degree that it is, to that degree the church will be pure. But that particular fact is the reason why the Lord tells us that we must be careful to make our calling and election sure. That we don't just simply think we're in the kingdom of God because we're in the visible church because again we've seen many can be in the visible church and still be outside of the invisible church or outside of the kingdom of heaven still be strangers to the grace of God. Now I think we're going to see some things this morning that are going to help us again see the contrast between the two kingdoms and what the members of the kingdom are actually like. But we also saw last week why the Father allows this division to exist, why he allows there to be evil in the world at all, and that is that he might bring good out of it. It was because of this division, because of these two kingdoms within his church, that our Lord was actually put to death. And that through his death, Jesus would gather together the children of God throughout the world. In other words, through this evil, God would advance his plan to save all of his people wherever they are scattered throughout the world. Now John begins to shift the focus again away from Jesus' enemies, at least the ones that are outside of the, the inner, well not the inner circle, but at least that circle of disciples, to his friends. We read that it's now six days before the Passover, that Passover where our Lord Jesus Christ was going to be betrayed and handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem as many of the Jews we saw last time already were in preparation for the feast. He's actually drawn very close because Bethany is essentially only two miles away from Jerusalem. But before he arrives, which we're going to see in a couple of weeks he does in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he stops in Bethany, in the town where he was earlier, where Martha and Mary and Lazarus all lived, where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus stops there to spend time with them. He stops there to express his love for them. He stops there to allow them the opportunity to express their love toward him as well as providing the opportunity for one of his own disciples to show which kingdom he was really in. Now, that's really what I, what I want us to see this morning are those three things. So first of all, let's consider we see here the love that Jesus has for his people. Again, we oftentimes think of Jesus sitting on the throne and we, we see him as the king who is telling us what to do, giving us orders and perhaps threatening us with punishment if we don't do it. This is not what Jesus is like. Okay, Jesus is one who loves us, he cares for us, he's a shepherd who shepherds a sheep. Yes, he does command us and we need to obey him, but he's, he's not, as it were, th commanding us under the threat of death, but rather he is calling us out of love and he'll even discipline us to get us to do what he wants us to do out of love. We do need to understand the character of our Lord Jesus Christ and how much he really loves us. And we see that here in the love he expresses toward his own. We read in verse 1, 
Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, we've already noted that with the Passover drawing near, Jesus comes again to Bethany, which was basically two miles outside of Jerusalem, to spend some time with Lazarus and with Mary and with Martha, those whom he loves. We saw that in chapter 11. Uh, now Jesus loved Martha, he loved Mary, and, and when they came to Jesus first to tell him about Lazarus, they said, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. Jesus loves his people. Now I think we would all agree that at this point in Jesus' ministry, with only a few days left of his life, that his time was actually quite precious. But look at how he chooses to spend it. Not by himself, not in seclusion, not as it were trying to shore himself up in order to do what the Lord has called him to do, though he will spend time doing that, but he spends his final days with those who are his own because he loves them. And we don't want to see just them ministering to Jesus. We do need to believe that Jesus was there to minister to them. Now when it comes to the Last Supper, Jesus is going to surround himself with his closest circle of friends, uh, excepting one, of course, who we're going to see this morning, and we know very well, was truly not one of his friends. At his arrest, Jesus is going to stand up for his disciples, and he's going to protect them. Jesus is going to say to those who come, if you are seeking me, let these go their way. The shepherd is going to protect his sheep. On the cross, he is going to lay down his life for them. After he rose from the dead, he's going to come to them again to assure them that all is well. And once he rose up into heaven, he was going to minister to them. And he was going to make sure they stayed in the grace of God. And the reason why he was going to do that was because he loves them. Jesus loves his own. Now this is the kind of love that Jesus has for us. If we have come to Jesus Christ, if we have trusted Jesus, if we are following the shepherd because we love the shepherd and we love the direction that he's leading us and we want to go that way, if, if this is true of us and we are following him out of love, we know that he loves us in exactly the same way that he loved his disciples. Uh, John tells us something which I think is very telling in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. He says, we love because he first loved us. How can we know that Jesus loves us, we can know by our love for him. If we love Jesus and we're following him, then it's because he loves us. If we love him and have come to him, he has come to us. He has come to us in the same way that he came to Martha and Mary and Lazarus, except in a much more intimate way, because he hasn't come to us physically, but he has come to us spiritually. Uh, he is actually taken up residence in our hearts. We are his home. We are his temple. He lives in us. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In a certain sense, our identity as individuals is swallowed up in who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we are essentially to be just like him. There are things that still distinguish us from him, not just our sin, but also certain personality traits. But in every way, we are to become uh, like him. Now when we go through difficult times, our Lord Jesus Christ comes to us perhaps even nearer than he does under, let's say, normal conditions. And that's often because the difficult times that we're going through will cause us to seek him more. And when we do, he draws nearer to us. Jesus loves us. He lives in us. And he comes to us because he loves us in Again, in much the same way as he came to these whom he loved, but in a spiritual way, he draws near. Now that, that sort of opened, I think, an interesting question. Just how close is Jesus willing to come to us? Just how close will he get to us? How much of his presence can we really experience in our lives? Well, the answer to that question really depends on two things. The first one is how close the Lord desires to draw near to us and that really has to do with revival, I think. You know, we talk about why is it that God sometimes draws near to mankind, sometimes he draws near to his church when his church is really doing nothing differently than they're ordinarily doing. It's because God has willed to come closer. 
And he has brought more of his spirit and more of his presence and we experience that closeness, which is what we're praying for. That, that's one thing and that's something we really don't have any control over it. But the other thing that depends or, well, that depends on this is how close we are willing to draw near to him. Now again, we, we have no control over how close what God wants to get to us. We can pray and we can ask him to draw near. But we do have control of the second. We can draw nearer to him. And if we are keeping our distance from him, why are we doing that? Why aren't we drawing nearer to the Lord? The only reason I can think of is because there is something it will cost us that we're not willing to pay. There's something that we are holding on to that we don't want to give up, that we're going to have to give up in order to get closer to Jesus. Now the question I would ask all of us this morning is, is anything really worth it to hold on to so that you don't, you're not able to draw near to Jesus than you otherwise can? Is there really anything that is worth it? We need to let go of whatever it is that's holding us back. We need to let go of it and draw nearer to him. Jesus wants us to come to him so that he may come closer to us. He wants to draw near. James writes in James 4, verses 7 through 8, Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So there is a sense in which we can draw near to God. We do have some control over this relationship. It depends on how close we're willing to get to him. And ultimately that depends on how much grace we already have. But we simply need to use the grace God has given to us, the desire, and submit to the Spirit of God as he leads us closer to, to, to the Lord and draw near to him. And as we do that, he will draw near to us. We can get closer. Now, maybe we didn't know that. Maybe we didn't know that there was anything we could do. Or maybe we didn't know how to do this, how to draw closer to the Lord. But we can have a much closer relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ if we really want to have it. So knowing that that is true, let's see how close we can get to him. Let's not see how far away we can get and still be in the kingdom of heaven. How much of, of these things of the world I can still have and still know I'm, I'm going to make it to heaven. That's not what the Lord wants us to do. But let's see how far away we can get from the world and how close and how far into the kingdom we can get and how useful we can become to him. Now let's also not forget that Jesus is only going to come to those who are his in this way, the way I'm describing now. You'll notice Jesus didn't visit the Jewish leaders like this, not like he, he did with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. He goes to those who are his own, and his own know when he comes near. There is a certain sense we have of the presence of the Lord, of his comfort, of his peace, and of his love. We know when the Lord is near. We know when he is far away, at least as far as our own you know, experiences. But the question I would ask you this morning is, has he come to you? at all is he living in your heart by faith if not you need to understand as well that Jesus invites you to come he doesn't want anyone to stay away from him he's not holding anybody back the only thing that holds anyone back from Jesus is them not him because Jesus actually calls all men to come to him John 7 verses 37 through 38 if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By the way, those rivers of living water, what we're talking about here when Jesus draws near, that's what you experience, is that fullness of the Spirit. That's what gives us love. That's what gives us power to do his will. And that also is what assures us that Jesus loves us. He says through Isaiah, the Spirit of Christ through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. 
and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. By the way, what is this money being spent on that is not bread and the wages for that which doesn't satisfy? What are those things? It's everything else but Christ. It's the things of the world which are sinful. It's the things of the world even that, that are good that, that one might become ensnared by because we love them too much and we can't let go of them. We're seeking those things rather than the Lord. The Lord says, those things aren't going to satisfy you. Come to me and I will give you what truly satisfies and that is Jesus. He is the only thing that satisfies. If you want the Lord to draw near to you, you must want him. You must want to draw near to him. And if you do, you won't be disappointed. You will be satisfied with the only thing that can truly satisfy your souls. And by the way, if you do draw near to Jesus, you will find that he has already been drawing near to you because you really can't unless he's at work in your soul. It's only those who are thirsty that are going to come to Jesus, that are going to come and drink, that are going to find their satisfaction in him. So first of all, we see Jesus loves his people and he comes to his people. He's willing to draw near to his people, to us. Secondly, we see the love that Jesus' own people has or have for him. I do want you to notice that we, we see them showing Jesus' hospitality. What, a, what an honor it would be to host Jesus, don't you think? It would be kind of fearful in a way because you'd be afraid you might you know, do something not quite right. But yet this one who is sitting at the table loves you more than anyone else and was about to lay down his life for you. If he, even if he did have something to say, he would say it in perfect love and it would be because he loves you. But in verse 2 we read this. So they made him a supper there. And Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. So we see they prepared a meal for him. We see Martha serving him. We see Lazarus reclining at the table with him with others who were also there among them, I imagine, his uh, disciples. Now think about this. I thought this was an interesting point. I believe it was Gil that brought this out. Being six days before the Passover and the Passover being, I believe, at this time, and I think it's something that moves around on, on the days of the week, but I believe on this occasion it was on Saturday. Six days before that, where would that put the day they're all sitting together? It would put it on Sunday or the first day of the week, the, the day that our Lord would enter into his rest. And Gil said, perhaps the Lord is providing for us here a picture, a picture of what, what the result was going to be of our Lord's work, that, that he would sit with his people um, on that day. There would be a day in which the church would recline with him at the table to rest from the things that we'd be doing on the other days of the week, the things that we have to do in this world, that we would sit down with the Lord at his table and, and fellowship with him and draw from him the strength that we need by his Holy Spirit to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do in the world. And actually, we do have a, a wonderful picture of that at the, very, at the Last Supper we have a picture of that as well, but here we have a picture of it on the day our Lord Jesus was going to raise from the dead, the day his new covenant church was going to meet of what we would be doing every Lord's Day, every Sunday following that resurrection, and that is sitting together with Jesus to worship and to fellowship and to draw from him his grace and his strength. Now, if we love Jesus, this is what we want. If we love Jesus, we want to spend time with him so that we might serve him better in this world as we're preparing for the world which is to come. We want to spend time with Jesus. Well, that's what they were doing. That's what they got to do with Jesus on that occasion in perhaps a much more intimate way in some ways than, than we think that we have. But actually, when you stop and think about it, we have perhaps an even more intimate way of spending that time with him. Now, by the way, Martha, we see her serving. We always see Martha serving, don't we? And sometimes Martha gets bad press because it seems like she's always serving and not sitting, you know, as we see again her doing here. Now, I just wanted to say that we're not to understand by this that we should always be sitting, you know, 
that Martha was doing a wrong thing and that Mary was doing the right thing. And what the Lord wants us to do is always to be sitting at his feet and always fellowshipping with him and learning from him and not serving. That's not what he's saying. But I do think what he is saying is there's a time to serve and there's a time to sit. And on the Lord's Day, we are to be more like Mary. We are to sit at the Lord's feet and fellowship with him. But on the other six days of the week, we are supposed to be more like Martha, serving him. But again, all of this is done out of love for the Savior. Now, we see secondly something extraordinary. An act of love and devotion that is singled out by John and by many of the other gospel writers. Something that would be spoken of wherever the gospel was preached and that is what Mary does next. We read in verse 3, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, what makes this extraordinary was the cost that was involved in, in this gift that Mary had just given to Jesus. Besides, of course, the fact that it came from a heart of love, it was given very willingly, but the sacrifice. Uh, Judas sets its value at 300 denarii, which you know by this time means 300 days wages. This is how much a man would make for working a 12-hour day for 300 days. This was very expensive. Now Jesus had been saving this ointment up until this time to bless her Lord. Not realizing, I think, when she was doing it, that she was anointing him for burial. But Jesus points out that's exactly what she was doing. In verse 7, after Judas said what he said, Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Now, I don't think the, the language here is very helpful and it's probably not translated as well as it could be, but Jesus is not saying here that leave her alone, she's going to keep what's left and she's going to wait till I'm dead and then she's going to anoint me, that somehow she was going to keep the rest for later because there's no record that she kept any of it, there's no record that she actually had the opportunity to anoint him later with his perfume, but rather what Jesus is saying is leave her alone because she has reserved this and kept it for this moment in order that she might anoint me for burial because there wasn't going to be time to do it later. So this, as I've said, was an act of love, a great sacrifice on the part of Mary. Now the question we need to ask here is this. Why was she willing to give something that was so precious to her to bless her Lord? Well, it's because obviously she loved him. When you love somebody as much as Mary loved Jesus, you are going to be willing to give whatever you have to give to make that person happy, to minister to that person, to comfort that person, to bless them. And I believe the question that this example asks each one of us is whether or not we are willing to give what is most precious to us to minister to him. Are, are we willing to give him what we have? You know, that's what the Lord actually says. We must be willing to give if we are to follow him. We have to be willing to give up all of our possessions. We have to be willing even to give up our own lives. Not just to die, but to give up what we might otherwise have wanted to do in order to devote our lives to serving him. Are we willing to do that? Now another question comes up. If that's actually what we wanted to do, how could we do that? How could we do it the way that Mary did it? I mean, because Jesus is not somewhere right now where we can come to him with an expensive gift and give it to him. So how can we minister to Jesus in this way if Jesus is in heaven? Well, let me give you a suggestion, the one that Jesus actually gives to us. Obviously, we can't go to heaven. We can't go to heaven to be where he is, at least not right now. We will eventually, and we'll get to worship him and serve him throughout eternity. We can't give him anything directly right now, and even if we could, I'm not sure that it would increase his blessedness except from the fact that he's going to be happier for us because we're doing what's right. We can't make him any happier. We can't make him any more comfortable. Not in the way Mary did when she anointed his feet and he was able to smell that, that, that wonderful fragrance and, and be comforted by the wiping, as it were, of the hair of his feet and so forth. We can't do that, but we can do something. We can minister to Jesus indirectly. 
Remember what's going to happen on the day of judgment? The saints are going to say to Jesus on that day, after he says, you know, you saw me here and you did this for me and so forth, in Matthew 25, verses 37 through 39, they're going to say this, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And he will say to them in verse 40, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Now whatever we do to any who belong to Jesus, who are his brethren, whatever we do for them, we are doing for him. We can feed Jesus. We can give him a drink. We can invite Jesus into our homes. We can clothe him. We can comfort him when he is sick. We can visit him in prison. Uh, we can pray for him. We can minister to him. We have the opportunity every single Lord's Day and throughout the week as we love and minister to one another because whatever we do for one another, we are actually doing for him. We can even do more than that. We can be his hands. We can be his feet. We can be his messengers to reach out, to gather in the rest of his people who were scattered throughout the world, those he was laying his life down for, that they might be saved. Jesus is in heaven, but there's still a great deal that we can do for him while we're here on this earth by ministering to his people. And that's what he wants us to do. And of course, if we love him, that is what we will do. So Jesus loves us with, with a, a love that is... Well, it is beyond description, right? <laughs> we see examples of it. We, we know something of it, but we really need the Spirit of God to open our eyes to the extent of it. But because of that love Jesus has for us, we love him in return. And out of that love, we want to show him how much we love him. And the way we can do that is, of course, by, well, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? But in keeping his commandments, this, he says, is what I command you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. You love one another. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for us because we are his friends. And we are to lay down our lives for him and for one another. Now, finally, we see that while all this love is being shared between Jesus and his own, we see the kingdom of heaven already present. You know, it's not a physical location, but Jesus says, hey, the kingdom of heaven is among you in the presence of the king, but it's also in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. We see that working of the Spirit already in their hearts by the love they're sharing with one another. We also see there was somebody present in that gathering who was clearly not in the kingdom who thought that what Jesus was doing, or actually what Mary was doing to Jesus, was a waste of money. I'll give you 10 guesses now, <laughs> okay. In verses 4 through 6, John writes this, But Judas Iscariot, one of, the, of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Now, doesn't that come as sort of a stark contrast to what we've just seen regarding Jesus' love for his people and his people's love for him? What is it that's true of those in the kingdom of heaven? Well, this love we just saw being shared among them. What is it that's true of those who are in the kingdom of darkness? This is what is true of them. Those who are Satan's are, are like him. And they're only concerned about themselves, not about Jesus and not about his people, they're looking out for number one. Now, if they serve Jesus at all, they only do so for what they can get out of it. Uh, now, we do need to back up just for a moment and, and understand it's okay to serve Jesus for things you get out of it as long as they're the things that Jesus promises to give you. You know, if we're serving him for earthly things, for worldly things, we're actually serving him for the wrong reasons. But if we're serving him for the spiritual blessings that he gives to us, that's good, that's right, that's what he wants us to do. But that's not what Judas was doing. Judas was following Jesus for a variety of reasons. Maybe he was thrilled by what he saw. 
Maybe he was also, you know, thought it was a, was a lot of fun to do miracles. You know, Judas actually did miracles, cast out demons and healed the sick. He was among those sent out, among the 12 and I think even among the 70. He was in it for the fun, but he was even in it for the money. He followed Jesus around and was given charge of the, of the money box and we're told here that he was a thief. He used to pilfer it all the time, steal what was in there, which is why he wanted Mary's ointment to be sold, the money put into the box so he could take it. He never followed Jesus for the things that Jesus offered. He was not a godly man. He only pretended to be for his own benefit. Jesus even reproved him for his seeming uh, concern for the poor. He says, you know, the poor are always going to be here. And you can minister to them anytime you want, but you're not always going to have me. That was a rebuke to Judas. Now, how can we tell which kingdom we're in? You know, from the example set before us. How can we tell whether we belong to Jesus or whether we, we belong to Satan? Well, I would say just compare your life to the different examples we have here. Are you like Jesus? Are you like Jesus' people? Are you sharing this, this love with one another that the Lord has for you? And are you loving the Lord and are you serving Him? You see, we can tell by the direction of our hearts. We can tell by what's in our hearts and the direction of our lives. Do you love Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Are you serving Jesus because you love him? Well then, you are in his kingdom. Christ is being formed in you. Have you not given your life to him? Are you not serving him? Or if you are serving him, are you only serving him for what it is you can get out of him of the things of this world? If that's true of you, then you are in the kingdom of darkness. Now, if this latter description does describe you, I would encourage you this morning to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ, even as we saw before. He's willing to draw near to you. He tells you to come in order that you might drink, in order that you might have life. He wants you to come, so draw near to him. Trust in him. Love him. Serve him. Follow him. And if you are able to do that, then you will know that you are in his kingdom and that you are safe. And that's, I think, where we all want to be. We all want to know that we are safely in the kingdom of heaven. Well, we're not going to know it just by coming forward and praying a prayer or by thinking, I believe the facts or that I am trusting in Jesus, but my life doesn't change. The evidence is a changed life because if, if you love Jesus then you will follow him. And if you love and follow Jesus, that means that he loves you. And you can know that you're in his kingdom. If that isn't true of you, then come to Jesus and trust in Jesus. Well, let's, let's take just a moment and allow the Lord to examine our hearts in this way. And I think it's very good preparation for the Lord's table, isn't it? Because... Are we willing to lay down our lives? Have we laid down our lives to follow Jesus the way that Jesus tells us he wants us to? This is my commandment, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Is that, is that what you're doing? Well, let's, let's examine our hearts and let's prepare to come to the table.